In the first case, the specific already given genetic makeup is being selected. In the second case, an already present genetic makeup is being altered. I'll begin with the first option, selecting a genetic makeup. In 2011, there has been an intensive political discourse in Germany concerning the ethical legitimacy of pre-implantation diagnosis. And it was decided that in certain very specific cases, when grave diseases are predicted, the selection procedure is supposed to be morally and legally legitimate. It's moving to the right direction, I think. What happens during this type of enhancement? Firstly, a in vitro fertilization has to take place. Then one or two cells from the fertilized egg get taken and their genetic makeup gets analyzed. On the basis of this analysis, the parents can decide whether the respective fertilized eggs can get implanted or not. The parents do not actively influence or put together a genetic makeup, but merely have the possibility of choosing some genetic options among a great variety of genetic variants. Given that many egg cells were fertilized and it's being done in the UK, selecting a fertilized egg after an in vitro fertilization and PGD is a procedure which concerning its morally relevant aspects, differs significantly from the process of actually changing a gene or maybe even actually creating a complete genetic makeup. Which type of freedom becomes important in this context? I think procreative freedom is what, what is at issue here, and procreative freedom is also what is at issue when we select a sex partner with whom we wish to have offspring. I also hold, hold that we have reasons to believe that there is a structural analogy between selecting one's partner in order to bring about a child and selecting a fertilized egg after an in vitro fertilization. In how far are these two procedures analogous? By choosing a partner with whom one wishes to have offspring, one thereby implicitly also determines the genetic makeup of one's kids, as 50% of their genes come from one's partner and the other 50% from oneself. By selecting a fertilized egg, um, one also determines 100% of the genetic makeup by, making a by means of the selection procedure. One of the objection which might be raised here is that selecting a fertilized egg cell is a conscious procedure, but normally one doesn't choose a partner according to their genetic makeup, such that one has specific genes for one's child. However, it can get replied that our evolutionary heritage might be more effective during the selection procedure of a partner than we consciously wish to acknowledge. In addition, the qualities according to which we choose a fertilized egg after a PGD might not have been chosen as consciously <coughs> as we wish to believe, but might be more influenced more on the basis of our unconscious organic set setup than we are aware of. It might even be the case that the standards for choosing a partner and for choosing a fertilized egg might both be strongly influenced by organic makeup and evolutionary heritage, such that both are extremely similar. The difference between these two selection procedures is surely that in the one case one selects a specific entity, a fertilized egg, but in the other case a partner, and there's only a certain range of genetic possibilities. However, given the latest epigenetic research, we know that genes can get switched on and off which makes an enormous difference on the phenomenological level. Hence, it's also the case that by choosing a fertilized egg, we only choose a certain range of phenomenological possibilities of the later adult, as, as is the case by choosing a partner for appropriate purposes. The aforementioned comparison provides some initial evidence for holding that there is a structural analogy between choosing a partner for appropriate purposes and for choosing a fertilized egg cell after PGD, which again provides some reasons for regarding the following line of thought as plausible. A liberal society allows its citizens to select one partner in order to bring about a child, as selecting a fertilized egg after PGD is structurally analogous to selecting a partner in order to bring about a child, it ought to be evaluated analogously. The liberal state imposes few restrictions concerning the election of a partner to bring about a child. While actually in Germany, incest among consenting adults is legally forbidden, which I think actually is highly problematic, even in Catholic Spain, such behavior is uh, le legally legitimate, by the way. And 
Well, the state also imposed, ought to impose few restrictions concerning the selection of the Crystallized Act of the PGD. The aim of this section was not to argue in favor of a liberal attitude towards selection procedures of the PGD, but to show that the central importance of procreative freedom, both when one is choosing one's partner, as well as when one is choosing a fertilized egg after PGD. Altering the genetic makeup. A different type of freedom becomes relevant when we are concerned with genetic enhancement by means of altering the genetic makeup given that this decision was made by parents for their offspring. This can take place in the case of the somatic genetic enhancement of fetuses, embryos, or babies, e.g. by means of transduction. In that case, educative freedom becomes central because there are reasons for holding that there is a structural analogy between educating one's child and changing the genetic makeup of one's child by means of somatic genetic enhancement which I've shown in an article beyond humanism, which came out in the Journal of Revolution and Technology in 2010. Both procedures have in common um, that decisions are being made by parents concerning the development of their child at a stage uh, where the child cannot yet decide for himself what it should do. In the case of genetic enhancement, we are faced with a choice between genetic roulette versus genetic enhancement, in the case of educational enhancement, we face the options of a Casper Hauser lifestyle versus parental guidance. On the basis of this analogy, the following argument can be suggested. A liberal society allows its citizens to educate their children. As changing the genetic makeup um, of one's child by means of somatic genetic enhancement is structurally analogous to educating one's child, it ought to be evaluated analogously. To have the right to educate one's child does not imply that there are no restrictions concerning how the child can be treated. If there are and ought to be restrictions concerning how to educate one's child, there ought to be restrictions concerning how to change the genetic makeup of one's child too. In liberal countries, there is also a type of duty to educate one's child. Analogously, it can be argued that there ought to be the duty to change the genetic makeup of one's child. Given this analogy and given the situation that in Germany with compulsory education, it becomes plausible to also demand the duty of genetic enhancement. As I and most citizens of European civilizations regard such a state governed version of enhancement, or should I say eugenics, as morally highly problematic, I recently suggested in a public debate um, um, to alter the law concerning compulsory education, which we have in Germany into a Bildungspflicht, the duty to bring about Bildung education into one's child, which does not demand that children go to school, but allows, allows the possibility of homeschooling or other options for educating one's child. Such a regulation is present in most other European countries. Even given a, a duty to educate Bildungspflicht and the analogy between genetic enhancement and classical education, in certain circumstances, genetic enhancement of one's shell can become a duty. However, my main goal within this section was to show which type of freedom becomes relevant in the case of genetic enhancement, given that adults decide to, uh, to alter the genetic makeup of their children, namely in that case, educated freedom. Normative freedom and genetic enhancement. Negative freedom and genetic enhancement. In this part, um, I will present some reflections concerning what needs to be taken into account when new challenges of genetic enhancement procedures are being dealt with. I present a hermeneutic pragmatism, which is a further development of uh, Batimo's Pensiero de Bolle. His possession ends up in hermeneutic communism, but mine can rather be classified as a pragmatic post-human and this will be liberalism. However, both of us explain what we put forward by means of the Nietzschean type of genealogy. By reference to historical processes, it is possible to put the importance of freedom and equality into the appropriate perspective. Um, I regard it as essential to recognize <coughs> that freedom is not an eternal truth, but was gained as a, as a result of long-lasting struggles, last struggles during the Enlightenment. 
as a dogmatic reliance upon a libertarian or social democratic liberal position leads to problematic consequences, I suggest that it's advisable to take a more pragmatic approach, which enables us to dynamically adapt to new challenges. To be pragmatic <coughs> would mean that no stable norm or basic integrity is given. The integrity which I'm suggesting refers to the insight that negative freedom is a precious achievement which members of many interest groups and from many social <coughs> and intellectual backgrounds have managed, managed to establish during the previous 500 years. It's an achievement which we should not abandon too easily, as it taken a long time to establish a widespread recognition of this norm and many intensive fights on various <coughs> levels were needed to bring about the realization of the importance of negative freedom. To stress the importance of negative freedom mm -hmm. does not mean that libertarianism is the most appropriate reply to our challenges, but it implies that only if too much negative freedom endangers itself, then equality ought to be considered further as long as the paternal paternalistic intrusions mm -hmm. implicit in the norm of equality do not impose too many rigid and strict uh, res um, strict restrictions upon the norm of negative freedom. The norm of negative freedom is one which always ought to be taken into consideration. The norm of equality, which is derivatively con connected to that of freedom, also needs to have its adequate ad place in a legal system. In daily poli politics, it ought to be considered that if negative freedom brings about too rigid and vast separation of the various social groups, then the aspect of equality ought to be considered further. If the decisions connected to the consideration of equality bring about too rigid and intensive intrusions of the state into private realms, then the focus ought to move back to freedom so that the dynamic and balancing dialectics of freedom and equality gets instantiated during which the historical achievement of the central norm of freedom um, must not be forgotten. In a recent monograph, I spelled all that out in more detail, the specific web of thought and implications connected to this approach. So which consequences would such an approach have for our current and future bioethical challenges? This position implies that morphological, procreative and attributive freedom ought to be of central importance, which also leads to a demand that legal regulation concerning enhancement techno uh, technologies ought to consider the norm of freedom more than most European laws in uh, most European countries do today. However, this position does not imply that one must disrespect the historical and cultural embeddedness of each country, as it's based upon a historical narrative by means of which the current situation gets understood. Um, I'm not committing a genetic fallacy because I'm not claiming that the historical origin proves the truth or fal falsity of the currently given norm. Right? It's a perspectivist position according, and according to an intellectually legitimate version of perspectivism, every perspective is an interpretation and this also implies to my own perspective, of course. Being a perspective does not imply that it's false, but merely that it can be false, which is a crucial distinction between a simple-minded and an intellectually legitimate version of perspectivism. However, I'm putting forward reasons in favor of the above-mentioned position, and I'm trying to show what I regard as the most plausible. To apply this approach in a specific situation currently implies in most European countries that changes towards a more liberal state of affairs are wanted, but also that such alterations need to be undertaken with care, because the future always needs the past, and it's not in the interest of human beings to be forced to adapt too fast to radical cha changes. It also means that the same legal reg regulations are not appropriate for all countries. In Germany, we have to deal with the fascist past, during which state government eugenic has been practiced. In the UK, it's already permitted to make research with human-animal hybrids or para-humans. To fight to face the bioethical challenges in the field of genetic enhancement implies that the past of a country gets taken into consideration because a significant group of citizens is still emotionally connected to them. Um, on the other hand, the latest research also needs to be considered. Um, an adequate dialectic, dialectics of freedom and equality need to be upheld, <coughs> and the wonderful norm of relative freedom must not be forgotten, because it has enabled citizens to live in accord with their own wishes, desires, and dreams, so that they can realize their own concept of having a fulfilled life. 
I will come to my conclusion. The aim of this paper was to put forward some guidelines concerning how best to deal with the normal freedom with respect to questions of genetic enhancement without falling into a dogmatic <coughs> trap. By stressing the importance of the dynamic community position, which takes seriously the impact and relevance of stru structural analogies, and which considers both the historical background of the country as well as the latest research outcomes in the central normal freedom, I wish to point out that even so it is plausible to hold that we are lacking absolute guidelines, we have some reliable and plausible cornerstones which provide us with a basis for dealing with new challenges. Concerning the latest challenges in the field of genetic enhancement, I showed in which way the normal freedom is relevant and in how far analogies between new technologies and already known procedures are given. Firstly, there was the morphological freedom, which gives us the right to alter ourselves, which can also get applied to the realm of genetic alterations. Secondly, there was the procreative freedom, which gives us the right to genetically determine our offspring by choosing our partner, which can also be applied to the field of PGD. And thirdly, there is educative freedom, which gives us the right and duty to provide our children with the best basis for the adulthood and which can also be applied to the field of genetic enhancement. To apply these insights in the decision-making processes of the various countries is a complex matter and cannot be done by means of some general remarks. <coughs> Each decision depends upon a detailed prior study and a careful way of progressing such that both due respect is being paid to the past, present and future, whereby all dogmatic single-minded solutions get rejected. A dynamic, open-minded inquiry which takes all the latest scientific and ethical insights and research outputs into consideration, but also attributes um, adequate respect to values and norms from which one's country has benefited immensely in the past, can lead to plausible solution in the difficult field of contemporary bioethical challenges. And the moral challenges related to the topic genetic enhancement are clearly significant for us as they touch the very basis of our understanding of human life. Yet I'm hopeful that by progressing carefully, we can benefit significantly from the wonderful scientific progresses without having to worry too much about the corresponding dangers connected to any type of progress. Many thanks for your time. Thank you, Stefan. Now, Sarah Chan has 15 minutes.